Bus Herding. Uh, Bus is a technology leader in the AI and big data domain. His academic background is in artificial intelligence and informatics. So please welcome on the stage Bus Herding. The title of his presentation is The State of MLOPS Machine Learning in Production at Enterprise Scale. Bus, the stage is yours. Hello, everybody, and thanks for uh, joining. Thanks for the nice introduction, uh, both from the sponsored and from the from the conference organization. Um, nice to uh, to be here, although not physically, because I'm I'm presenting here from my uh, from my own home, back in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, to be uh, to be precise. But um, yeah, I guess that also gives a nice opportunity for everybody to join, you know, across the world from wherever you are. Um, we're going to talk about ML ops today, machine learning operations, um, and I guess yeah, you've might, you might have heard about it. What what what's what's the what's the big deal in, in ML ops? What is it? Uh, I'm going to give a bit of introduction about that, and we'll do a bit of a deep dive into some of the best practices and uh, concepts and technology that uh, come together with this field of research. Um, a little bit about myself first, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, yeah, I think the introduction said it, said it all. I'm technology lead in the AI and big data domain. Uh, you can find me on uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera, so I'm happy to uh, connect. I also wrote uh, a couple of books. Uh, I have to say I co-authored them because I'm not the only author in this uh, on this um, on these books, but. Um, uh, so, um, if you want to do some, some hands-on work with, with this topic, then should, uh, I would recommend the book The Artificial Intelligence Infrastructure Workshop by Fact. And if you want to know more about data engineering in general, a nice book is by O'Reilly, 1970 Things Every Data Engineer Should Know. Okay, let's start with um, machine learning, because um, ML Ops, the ML is of course machine learning, and that comes from a bit of a hype. Uh, nowadays, everybody's doing ML and AI. Um, what is it actually? Actually, uh, Well, first I want to share a definition with you. And don't worry, because this is probably the slide with the most text that I have in my presentation. Machine learning is, um, is, set, is, is defined as follows. A, a, a computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P. If its performance at tasks T as measured by P improves with experience E, as defined by Tom Mitchell in 1979. Um, 1997, I have to say, sorry. Um, this might be sound a bit you know, abstract and a bit academic, but actually this is, I like this definition because this what it actually says, and I, and I translated it below actually here, is that a machine learning model is an, just an algorithm that uses sample data, training data, to make a prediction about new data, about testing data without explicitly being programmed how to do it. And this can, of course, be very something very complex, like a deep learning algorithm. It can also be something very simple, uh, like uh, you know, just a formula uh, that, 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 that also can also be said to be machine learning. And this definition takes away a bit of the, you know, the fuzz around this, about, about you know, machine learning, about you know, all, the, all the, 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 the negative sides about it, and also the, 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 the fuzzy things around it. Like, when people are talking about machine learning in enterprises, because they usually think it's a bit scary, it's a bit strange, it's it's new, it's like you don't really know what 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 will be predicted, what 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 comes out of this machine learning algorithm. And that, of course, sometimes that is true, but by making it very flat and explicit like this, I think it takes away a bit of this, yeah, of this uh, fuzzy uh, cloud around what we're actually doing. And nowadays. Machine learning, of course, very common in a lot of big organizations. Um, in 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 recommendation algorithms that that are used in uh, in all the services that we use, like like uh, like social media and Netflix, etc. In retail, when you get recommendations while shopping, for example, social media, yeah, when you're browsing through your uh, feed on Facebook, Instagram, etc. All those kind of behavior is being determined by machine learning algorithms. And what are they? Yeah, they, they are a specialized bunch of, yeah, uh, of of uh, of uh, technology. Uh, every there's, there's first of all to start with, there's several types of machine learning: supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning, and each of those 
kind of types of machine learning also come with their own type of algorithms. So they all own kind of like formulas how to calculate the best recommendation for customers. Um, but um, it's, it's also uh, very, very similar, very common, because um, you have to realize that these, uh, these algorithms that I, that I have here, the, the, these type of machine learning algorithms, basically all still do the same thing and as, as, I, as I presented in, my, in the definition there. They take sample data, historical data, run an algorithm on top of that and produce some kind of recommendation or prediction about the future on new data. But what you usually see when you're starting with machine learning in organizations or in research or in small startups, usually people doing this. And what is this? This is a notebook, um, like a Jupyter notebook. It's, it's a tool basically to work with data. Um, and this is great usually because this gives you a lot of power on your fingertips to be able to crunch uh, as, we, as we use this word, uh, data in a really nice way. Uh, so uh, when you're working with data sets, this, this uh, a notebook gives you a, a, a nice power, the nice, the nice overview to to display the tables very quickly, very graphically, to make some graphs, to change a little little bit of code, run it again, see the output immediately, get get feedback immediately, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But of course, uh, this is very difficult to productionize. Uh, if you are a data scientist and you come up with something like this, like, hey, yeah, okay, this great notebook, and that this predicts, I don't know, you know, a recommendation, this predicts like the, the next uh, best uh, action for a for a customer when he's browsing the web shop. Yeah, that, that's great, but how can you actually incorporate this in your architecture, in the rest of your software components? So the first realization that you have to do is that machine learning is not notebooks <laughs> and made sounds like a bit like a, like a, like an open door but uh, this can be a useful tool but that's also all that, it, that, that, that there is to it um, this tool is only producing a small piece of your infrastructure of your architecture of the whole package that you need to deploy when you're doing professional software development and that tool is only producing this small, black box in the middle, the machine learning code, that indeed contains this small or large, doesn't matter, algorithm that's made that makes kind of prediction. But there's a whole bunch of um, yeah, tooling and software around it to manage that. Now you have to do some data collection, data preparation. You have to do feature extraction from this data. Then there's the whole uh, monitoring and, and uh, deployment and uh, analysis life cycles here that, 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 are, uh, that come together with that. So this notebook that you started with, this, where this data scientist that, that, that is working with this, is just working on a small piece of your code, basically. And then comes MLOps to the rescue. Because um, if you realize that, that you know, data scientists, the, the machine learning algorithms are important, but they are only a small part of you know, the bigger architecture, then the question, of course, like, okay, how can we then properly manage that? And how can we do, do this entire, um, this entire, how can we you know, work with this entire landscape of tooling and, um, and, and software that comes, that comes together with this? First, I want to take a back, step back to DevOps. And this is a, a movement that started roughly 10 years ago, uh, where suddenly people had a same, the same kind of problems when they were doing ordinary software development. Because in that, that day, you know, 10 years ago, um, machine learning was not so common yet. It was a bit on, on the academic side, but people were, of course, deploying and releasing software in production. But if you would work at, let's say, a large bank, how that would normally be done is that you would have a software development department and you would have a maintenance or operations department. And something that has been developed, like a piece of software, a, a, you know, a, a, an application, was developed in the development department and then handed over to the, to the operations department to maintain it. And 10 years ago, people were suddenly realizing, hey, this is not the proper way to do software development. We should actually combine these roles in one team. Development and operations to, should work together frequently to yeah, to release software and to deploy it and to maintain, maintain it and to you know, uh, iterate on it um, uh, effectively. And this, this came, of course, together with the agile development, 
with like uh, methodologies such as Scrum and Kanban, um, where this was all about you know fast uh, delivery of software, uh, reacting to the environment quickly, being able to incorporate feedback from users quickly and produce a, a new version, and then not not you know in in a year time, but next week actually. And this was very successful. And now I think this is the majority of the software is being developed in this way. And then MLOps is a bit of the same. We, we should actually think of MLOps not as a of, of machine learning and data science, not as a separate discipline, but as part of the of, of one team. So next that you would have development, developers and operations to combine them in, in, in your team. There's a new you know, flavor being added, basically, and that is machine learning. Uh, and uh, what 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 you have in the in the center of these kind of disciplines is MLOps. And uh, the reason that I want to stress this is because um, MLOps is not about uh, tooling, for example, or it's not about um, you know which which uh, which which technology you'll be using. It's more about how you will organize yourself as a team and how you will you know interact with with your colleagues uh, to uh, to make the best of your machine learning models. And that's that's the that's the first realization when it comes down to uh, building a successful team around machine learning models. It also comes, of course, with some yeah roles and responsibilities. There is new yeah work to be done in such a team. Uh, for example, building models and training models. So you would have, typically have a data scientist on your team that is responsible for that type of work. But if you combine that with you know other people in your team that 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 do the more traditional work like data engineering, software engineering, uh, and uh, operation work, like monitoring, scaling, infrastructure, et cetera, you would have the, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the, yeah, the roles and responsibilities combined in one team. And um, <clears throat> this also doesn't mean, of course, that you know, your team would, should consist of uh, five people. Uh, there, there's, it's perfectly possible to build a small team where uh, a data engineer also takes up the role of a data scientist. And a dev engineer also takes up the role as a machine learning engineer. But so it's good to realize that there's multiple disciplines and there's multiple specialities in your team, but combining them in one team and making sure that all these roles are being, yeah, being fulfilled is an important realization when you're starting to work with machine learning models. Uh, and how you can do that in a team is, uh, for example, the Spotify model, again, also an, uh, an older picture, but uh, still very uh, relevant. Um, Spotify actually didn't use this model themselves, but it's called the Spotify model anyway for some reason. Uh, but um, the, the 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 idea behind this is to create uh, chapters and uh, we, we, where, where where data scientists, for example, in a data science chapter, can still work together and still um, share best practices and still you know hang out basically with uh, with the people that are doing a similar kind of work. But that they are that the, the real work is done in squads, which are multidisciplinary teams where, where 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 these kind of roles are combined to work towards a single purpose and a single goal. With all, yeah, basically these goals, these goals have, have been already uh, formulated since uh, since the DevOps age, gaining trust. Yeah, you can make if you release something frequently, uh, like every week or every day, maybe. You gain trust that okay, the next release is also going to be successful. If you do it on a, like every six months or every year, the next release of your software, whether it was it will be like a piece of uh, infrastructure or an app or a website or a machine learning you know, model that that, that that is running in, in, in an API, will be yeah will be scary yeah because you never know what how it's going to be like. But if you do it every day or every week you'll probably have a lot of trust saying, okay, yeah, the next one will also be, be okay. And if it's not okay, we can fix it. Right? We have monitoring in place. We, we have a continuous integration pipeline. So the next update, the next rolling forward update of my software will actually be, uh, be, be easy because we've done it a hundred times already. And it will be, of course, to gain speed because rather to wait for the next release that it will be in a few months time or so, or next machine learning model that, that, you know, that comes from a different department of data scientists that are you know, doing who knows, who knows what. There's integration in the team, people know what they're doing, they work together and they will actually uh, be faster in this way. Um, <clears throat> the machine learning algorithm itself, 
is, uh, and we're going to the technology side a little bit now, um, is, is, I think it's very important that, that, that you can ju just consider it to be an asset. So what is in a machine learning algorithm normally when you know, data scientists are working with their notebooks or with other tools, of course, uh, you might realize that you might understand that I'm not such a big fan of notebooks, but okay, that, that's the tools that a lot of people are using anyway. So the outcome of that should be a artifact. It should be a machine learning model that is exported to an intermediate format like Pickle or Joblib uh, that can be actually uh, managed and maintained like any, yeah, what is it, um, any asset in your, in your, uh, in your infrastructure. Uh, just compare it to uh, like a, a picture or, or uh, some other important file. So it can be attached with, it, it has to be attached with metadata, with, it has to have a certain life cycle, it has to be, you know, retrievable, findable, findable in, in, a, in a certain place, and it can just be used in your other, you know, other parts of your infrastructure. How you do that, we'll talk about it later, because you can, for example, wrap it in an API. Um, another best practice is to actually uh, do proper monitoring on this. So, and um, this is nothing new probably to a lot of a lot of engineers because they will say, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm closely monitoring what goes on in my application. I know, you know, I know the CPU usage. I know if there's not a disk that runs full, if you're running on, you know, non-cloud uh, hardware, I know uh, what the latency is of my, of my uh, services, et cetera, et cetera. That's still important, huh? but I call it a bit of the technical metrics that you, that you, that you still have to comply to. And if you're run, running with machine learning models, it's also very important to have a look at the business metrics or the performance metrics. How is my model behaving? What is it doing in production? What is it predicting? Uh, uh, a new model uh, will, you know, it, it's trained on newer data and it can have effects on, uh, you know, on unknown data that is coming in. So, uh, for example, um, if, if you would predict the delivery times of, um, of, of packages in a retail, of, 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 you know, in, in, in a retail organization, and the average uh, uh, a lead time of a package will be like one uh, one day or uh, let's say twenty four hours. It will be very strange if suddenly a model will, on average, predict uh, two days or predict uh, six hours or something like that. And if that happens, of course, you want to know, okay, what's going on? Maybe the algorithm is correct because there might be an effect not only environment that has led to you know, longer lead times, maybe you know, a supplier or a carrier or uh, uh, something, something has happened where you know, it just takes longer to deliver packages, sure. It can also be that there is actually some, you know, something going wrong in the training of the model and, um, uh, and the model actually has to be retrained again and to, to, to fix the outcomes of this. So monitoring these kind of metrics the business metrics is quite crucial in, uh, in machine learning model operations. Um, how does it look a bit in the on the architecture side, on the on the technology side a little bit? Um, well, I, I try to draw the most simple um, <clears throat> diagram that I could think of when it comes to um, yeah to how you do this. Um, and this this. Um, so I already mentioned that. The first step of, 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 of using a machine learning model in production is exporting it to a intermediate format so it can be treated as an asset, as a file. That whole, that whole process of doing that is being done by a, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, 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 show it like this, is done in a batch job. In a bat, normally, yeah? so no, normally a batch job is running, let's, let's say, every week. The batch job has the, the, the goal of creating a new model. That what the best job is done in a model training process. So it can be an orchestrated uh, uh, process like an airflow job mm, or simple cron job that executes the model training pipeline. And uh, that process takes input data from a feature store. Feature, features are the, the input parameters, the input data for the model and writes it and it produces at the end a model that's, that's an, an exported file and puts it in a model repository. And this is of course the, the, the part where I said, okay, this, this, this file, this asset needs to be properly managed. It has to have a certain life cycle, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do that by storing it in a proper model repository. It doesn't have to be, have to be that complex. It can also be just a file share with you know, proper metadata management, but you probably, you, you really want to have this all organized in a good way. 
from there it can be picked up by your real-time pipeline because your model should be running somewhere in production where it can you know generate recommendations um, uh, predictions uh, it, you know it, it can actually be executed and the proper way to do that is to wrap this model in a kind of a, yeah, software component, usually an API, or maybe an entire application, we'll talk about it later as well, that is pos that, that, that is responsible for interacting with this model file. And so this, uh, this, uh, this component here is probably maybe also updated when a new model arises. So I have model three, version three, I retrain it to model version four, or maybe model version 3.1 is being retrained to model version 3.2, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this component learns about it, redeploys uh, uh, itself with a new model in, in, inside of it, and that way you have it running in production. There's usually some data preparation and post-processing or pre-processing and post-processing going on to work properly with this model, because uh, data that comes from, for example, a web, web store will not be in the correct format yet, usually, to um, uh, to just dump into the model. It has to be, you know, it has to be prepared. It has to be like uh, some, 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 uh, some type changes, some maybe uh, time zone conversions, uh, maybe maybe there needs to be some uh, feature combinations that, 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 that need to be calculated, et cetera. That's done in, in this step. And there has to be some post-processing because what the model will actually produce is usually not so useful. It will be like a score from, let's say, zero to one. Yeah, so the model says, okay, the score is uh, 0 0.55. Yeah, okay, what does that mean? Eh? Uh, the post-processing step will actually interpret the score and define you know, what, what's next. What, how, what, what does the customer actually see? Um, <clears throat> An example of this kind of architecture, but in 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 real life, is uh, is this picture from a company I currently uh, work for, Wayfair. We run machine learning models in production in this in this in this way, and it's 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 important to realize that this combination of batch and real time, so this high level view of a batch job that produces a model and a real time pipeline that's you know runs and executes the model, can be seen in a lot of places, including you know, these kind of architectures. So we have uh, the model trainer in this case is running on Airflow. It's producing a, a, um, a, a, a model that is being uh, run from, uh, from a Kubernetes API. So the model repository is the model is in the model repository is running from a Kubernetes API and that is being um, uh, displayed in the web shop backend to, for example, display the, the lead times for customers when they are ordering uh, furniture. Um, and also, um, the the big, like I say, reference architectures of the the, the 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 famous reference architectures by the cloud vendors, for example, Google Cloud. Uh, I published uh, one here from Microsoft, Azure, and Amazon. Use the same setup. They really are similar. Uh, of course, they will fill them in with their own tools, like you see here on Amazon. They say, yeah, yeah, yeah I should use. Um, Amazon uh, CloudFormation and Amazon SageMaker to, uh, to, to, to train the model. And uh, Microsoft has their own tools here as well, like Azure Machine Learning to, uh, to deploy the model, et cetera. But they work with on the same principles. They work with a batch job that produces a model with a real-time pipeline, basically, that serves the model and, and executes the results and displays them in, yeah, in, in production, basically. Um, a little bit about the tooling itself. So, I, I assume that um, that uh, people know these uh, these kind of cloud vendors, but there's a lot more. So um, this is also maybe an, an effect of the slightly um, yeah I don't know maybe um, hype that has been created around uh, ML ops and and maybe also a bit of the still uh, immature um, yeah field of research that that, that we're in because there's, there's a lot of tooling that you can. That you can work with, that you can find, that you can buy, that you can you know download. Uh, when it comes to these kind of uh, these kind of uh, uh, things, so for every small piece in this architecture, there's easily uh, ten or twenty tools that that claim they're the best product uh, to to uh, to uh, to train your models, to automatically de deploy them, to score your models, to do feature engineering, to store features in a feature store, etc. 
And of course, it's impossible to know them all. Uh, but I think the best way to deal with this kind of problems to, to, to do tool selection is to go back to your own company and to really ask yourself, okay, what, what kind of tool does my organization fit? So in this talk, I will not recommend any of those tools. I will not say, you know, you should use this one or this one, or you should build it yourself or use open source, or you should go with it, with the cloud vendors, etc. because it's impossible to say. Uh, it is also, it, you know, I, I might have some opinion about it, but it might be only my opinion. It might be some something that, you know, I, I like and I've worked with, but it will not exactly fit the organization uh, where you are in. So if you want to do that, I think it's more important to, to focus on, you know, if you want to do MLOps, it's more focused to focus on the on the on the, the team structure first, yeah, what I explained, and the architecture, and then the tooling choices will be done later. And uh, I, unfortunately, I see a lot of companies that work the other way around. They first select a tool because, yeah, you need MLOps, right? You need to run machine learning in production. And after maybe a few months, they start realizing, yeah, okay, hmm, hmm, hmm. what is it actually that we are trying to solve here? What are, what are, what are, what are we doing? Cannot we use, you know, can, can we build something ourselves? Hey, we already have something uh, like a database that can fill in a feature store or we can, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So whatever you pick, uh, pick carefully and, and think about these kind of questions first. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of detail now, because uh, we're running towards uh, the end of the presentation a little bit, um, because um, I promised I, I will go into detail a bit about how you can actually run your models in production. And again, um, there's different options for this. And I, I picked four of the, of, the, uh, of the most common ways to, um, to, to pick up these files, uh, these model files that you, that, that you would have that are the result of data scientists, you know, crunching data and, and, uh, and, and working with notebooks and, um, and uh, doing feature engineering and et cetera. Okay, so great, you have, you have one of those files. How can you now run this in your production environment? Um, so actually what we're talking about now is only the, let's go back, the model scoring uh, microservice or component that, that is, that is uh, that's in this architecture. How do you actually use this, these, these models and make sure that they are you know, stable, high performing, uh, how do you uh, ensure that you know, you know they, they can be monitored, that they that they have the the, the right version um, uh, when when going live? How can they be easily upgraded, etc.? Well, there's a few options for that. Uh, to start with, the first one, you could actually just incorporate this model file in your application. Let's say you have a, like a monolithic application anyway; it still exists. Uh, uh, then, yeah, sure. As I said, this is just a file, right? Your model is just a file, so it will be, it will get a place somewhere in your, in the backend of your application, uh, together with other, you know, logic, other business logic, other code, uh, other, you know, API code, etc. And it will ed eventually end up in an app um, with with your users. But this is not so, yeah, flexible eh? because um, th 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 this would really be a tightly coupled uh, situation where your model will be you know, part of your monolithic backend and we don't want that nowadays. You want to be flexible. You want to easily be, you know, we, we should easily upgrade our model. We should be able to, um, um, to, to, put, uh, to, to get a new version out, uh, to actually add new models. To, uh, to experiment with models, let's say, to do A-B testing or uh, canary releases, those kind of things. So it's, it's better, it's, it would be a better practice to separate the model in some kind of a dedicated uh, layer, in some, some kind of dedicated component. And one way to do that is to buy or build or download you know, a tool that is doing just that. It's just doing model management. And that's the second, scenario called shared service, where you would have a dedicated tool that you know, contains one or multiple models, and it does this job of just managing those models and integrating them in the rest of your business logic and your API, et cetera, in the rest of your application. That's a perfect valid scenario. It also has some downsides, of course, because you have to manage this tool again. But okay, that's up to you. That's 
that might be a good choice to, to, to make. Another one is to uh, go one step further in uh, decoupling and saying, okay, I'm just creating a API around my model for every model that I have. So <clears throat> let's say I have uh, 10 models in production. For every model that I have, I'm creating a thin wrapper around this. It is just you know, gathering the data, executing the model and producing the result and giving it onwards to the next microservice that runs in, uh, that runs in my in my architecture, and this is indeed uh, what you would what you what you would uh, do if you're if you were uh, yeah if you're keen on microservice development, and it's a very modern way of of application uh, development nowadays where you know, things are decoupled, things can be easily upgraded, thing you know components can be interacting with each other. They you know, you can have um, you can you can have uh, upgrades of of single components without touching the rest, etc. etc. But that also comes with some downsides because there is more infrastructure to manage. Yeah? Because all these models run in dedicated containers and components, and that has to be managed. So they have to be findable. They have to be, you know, uh, they have to be uh, managed again. Uh, they also have to be communicating with each other. So how do you do that? Maybe direct communication, okay, or maybe you know with a message bus in between. That's also good, but it also your message bus needs to be managed and maintained. And yeah, you need to uh, make sure that, uh, for example, the schemas that are defined to interact with these models are kept in sync and are uh, upgraded as well. So this also this all looks very nice, but every choice comes with some, some downsides as well. Um, and the final one I want to mention is um, a bit of a strange one because this, and that is streaming, because uh, there's also an option to uh, to load your model in in a stream. If you're really doing um, streaming data processing with lots of data, with lots of event data, and you want to, for example, execute a machine learning model on every event that comes in, then um, uh, um, publishing your event in an API might not be so good because there will be too much network latency going on. So what you want to do actually is load your model in memory, and there's also dedicated formats that you can use for this, so that the execution of this model is lightning fast. It's you know it's it has the same performance as you know running uh, code in your streaming pipeline. Um, you know that, that is just doing mapping, filtering, etc. The typical things that you do in streaming data processing, um, and that is a, a very interesting model as well because that uh, allows you to uh, run machine learning models in high performance, you know, low latency uh, data streams. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we have the concept of feature store. Um, I, I mentioned this already a bit. What is a feature store? Uh, well, a feature store is, is just a database. That's uh, usually at least how, how it's being, uh, being, uh, being, being viewed for storing features. And what's the difference in, in features in in, in, in regulation to, to ordinary data. Well, features are you know, changing constantly because features are usually uh, pre-computed or aggregated. For example, a feature for a machine learning model, typical feature might be the average amount of something in the last period. Let's say the average amount of uh, sales that uh, has, you know, that the company has uh, done in the last uh, uh, hour or um, the, 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 the variance in, um, in the weather for, in, the, in the weather in the last uh, week or so. And of course that, 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 is, that, that are quite, that can be quite complex uh, data points to calculate. So what you want to do actually is to pre-compute them and not compute them once you, once you need them. You want to store them so that they can be easily retrieved and update them while your data is being yeah, is 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 being is being um, uh, is is processing actually. So um, um, feature stores are good in uh, handling these kind of capabilities. They are good in uh, storing features for quick retrieval, but also uh, being able to uh, to 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 be updated while your users are using your 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 system and while you know raw data is is coming into your system. Uh, do you need this? Well, again, it depends. And sometimes um, your mo the models that are, you know, I've seen models that are, that are so simple 
just an ordinary database can serve perfectly as a feature store. Uh, it doesn't have to be any kind of complex technology because you know, the, 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 there's, you know, the, there's no high performance requirements, et cetera, et cetera. But if things get complic more complicated, a feature store is a recommended way to think about your features and to uh, make sure that uh, they are managed in a proper way. Um, okay, I'm gonna wrap up because we're almost out of time as well. Um, yeah, what I said, uh, MLOps, uh, what is it about? Well, it's about applying the DevOps principles and practices on machine learning models. So I really on purpose started with this team structure and thinking about you know uh, uh, the way that people work together. I think that, that is what the core of MLOps is to me, to gain trust and speed, et cetera. Uh, but of course, it also comes with some specific uh, technology and architecture. And I, uh, I think it's important to realize that there's two, these two data pipelines that you always have to manage, the best and the real-time one. Uh, and there's some tools such as the feature stores, et cetera, that can help you with uh, maintaining this, uh, this architecture. Uh, if you want to know more, then um, yeah, some, some, some resources here that I could recommend. First of all, of course, uh, my, my, my book again, that, that uh, gives a bit of this uh, hands-on uh, skills uh, for you if you want to practice with this. There's actually nowadays a Coursera special, specialization called MLOps that really uh, teaches you and, and also have to, has a hand-on uh, 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 course uh, on, on MLOps. Uh, and there's the website MLOps.org, which is also recommended for uh, reading further in this kind of uh, discipline. Um, yeah, that concludes my talk. So um, I'm happy to take any questions, actually, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Bas, for, the, for your presentation. And we have a few minutes for questions before uh, we have the next session. So we have a question. How do you see in which directions will this area evolve in the future? The misdirections with AI, with AI, is that the question? Actions will this evolve? I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't understand the question. Fair. So, sorry, could you, could you repeat it? So how do you see in which directions will this area uh, develop in the future? Ah, I was, the, the, this area will develop in the future. Yeah, I, well, there's, there's a few uh, interesting developments I think uh, going on. First of all, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's start with the obvious. I, I think everything is, is moving to the cloud. So the, the, the bigger cloud vendors will actually, uh, they, they, they will push their own technology. Uh, so I'm working a lot with Google at the moment and they have, they, 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 come, they, they come up with new features, new tooling almost on a weekly basis. For example, Vertex AI, like a whole machine learning um, environment that you can use for not only training your models, but also for running them in production and for deploying them, et cetera. Basically, that's, that's what MLOps is about. And so there will be a heavy push uh, from, from, these, uh, from these cloud vendors. But also I see other uh, companies that, that, um, that are really um, yeah, seeing this as an opportunity to, um, uh, yeah, uh, to, 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 to grow into. Um, uh, one example I want to, want to give is maybe Databricks. Databricks is, used to be a company that, is, that was focused on uh, Apache Spark, uh, just running Spark pipelines uh, in, 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 in Teams. And they, they, they did, did a good job, of course, in that. But they've really grown and moved on to basically any part of data management and data operations that you can think of. Uh, so that's also, they're also moving in this direction. So I'm personally very curious to see what the bigger companies will be, uh, will be doing and how it will be yeah, interacting or not with the open source community. Thank you. Then the next question. This presentation was just so cool. I couldn't stop uh, create notes. <laughs> Can you talk about <laughs> your book uh, a little? That's uh, that's a very nice compliment. So thank you, uh, first of all. Um, yeah. So the book is 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 um, is, is, is a hands-on book, as I already uh, mentioned, uh, which uh, which starts at the basics, like how do you uh, do proper uh, data management? How do you store data? Uh, and then moves on to more complex 
topics like how do you build a model and how do you deploy, deploy a model. Moving on to actually all the, 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 the advanced topics that I also mentioned in this, in this talk already, how do you deploy a model, for example, in a streaming data pipeline? And that, that, that is, of course, the, in, the, in, in this book, I think the nice thing about this book is that uh, several uh, techniques and tools are being used. You also don't, don't have to read the whole book or so from start to beginning. You can pick you know, the, the things that are relevant for your, for, your, uh, for your own use case and pick also the technology that you think is the best. And so if you want to work with uh, you know, uh, Python scripts, that's, that's, that's great. But if you want to work with Java, uh, that's, also, that's also fine. Thank you. Thank you, Buzz. So there are no more questions at the moment.